Hopefully by now all of you have gotten your newsletter and you will note on March 22nd the Renaissance Choir will be with us here on that Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. And this time we're in the past we've had the larger choir and we've had the smaller choir. This will be a 55 member choir. They will be with us on the 22nd. And the night before we're singing several other productions. And uh, we have to have rooms for uh, them, and so I like one more room. I, I have three committed so far to pay for a room the night before for their production crew. And so if you are willing to pay for a room for one of them to stay in, if you can see me at the church so far, I have, we only have to have four rooms this time, and uh, three of them are committed to. Also on your prayer list. Look on the back side, and you will see Charmaine Williams. Charmaine Williams is Bonnie Watson's mother, and she had surgery about two weeks ago, and she is in surgery at this time, having a, another surgery on her hip done. And so we ask that you be with Bonnie and her family. And then also, these are friends of Kevin and Jamie's Sears, uh, Dennis Corbana. It was spelled U R B A N I A. He's getting a heart and a liver transplant at Vanderbilt. And so, you know, I'm sure the surgery is over by now. He's in that part, making sure your body doesn't reject those organs. So be sure that you uh, add them to your prayers. We will add them to it as well. Let's see. Also, uh, Add, we, we meant to add all the people who have been affected by the tornadoes of Nashville and the surrounding area of Tennessee. And the Cumberland Presbyterian Church family, our family there was affected. Their nursery worker was killed in uh, that tornado. And also they had three families in that house and their congregation were houses have been destroyed. And as many of you know, we own property in Mount Juliet, but our property was not destroyed the way the tornado came. Here's 40 and, and, and Old Highway 70. Our property's on this side of the road. All the damage was primarily done between 40 and 70. When it came out of East Nashville, it just went down up Highway 70 and 109 and one in that area there. But it has done extensive damage there. And the coming Presbyterian Church will, will be organized. Everybody rushes at the beginning to help, but trust me, if you've been in the national area or you've been, especially in Putnam County, which was Cookville, which was the greatest hit uh, there, you have read about all the lives that have been lost. But I saw something I thought was very good this morning, and, I, and it doesn't name who, but it just said that there have been two major companies in that area that have been and paying for all the human services. For their families, it is a remarkable thing. As well as many people are responding uh, to uh, the needs in the Come Presbyterian Church kids, uh, going to be doing something, and like I say it'll be weeks, months uh, uh, recovery from all of this. So just keep your ears and eyes open for all of that. Okay. Are there other announcements today? The flowers on the table. Jude, where is it? Happy seventh birthday. These flowers are given by your mom and dad and your sister. Judah here. Okay. Uh, let's see. And also, Mark Faye has her surgery done tomorrow. And I'm going to in choir practice. And they all laugh at this. Uh, but I'm not sincere. Oh, yeah. I'm not If you decide to bring me any food at all for Faye and Cullery, a free love card. Okay. <laughs> they all laugh.
And the thing that, that upset me the most, and Snap Brown's not even here to appreciate this today. Snap is the one who always sends me little notes that the ball games your hair looks good. But can you imagine in the picture the only thing that I've done in my picture was my wife? My hat. And they couldn't correct it. <laughs> I was very <laughs> The lady said, no. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other announcements? We've been glued together into the presence of God by a loving God. So come now, let us bring our whole self into this worship service, into this place of grace, of love, and joy. Will you join with me as we worship our God?
But you know, I think we don't know what we're saying when we say it because there's only one who has saved us, one Savior, one Redeemer who truly has saved our lives. It is the blessed Redeemer that we're going to sing about this morning and praise His name. So would you stand with me as we sing blessed Redeemer.
with this thought upon our hearts. When you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give not to be praised or thanked, but to praise God and proclaim the good news of salvation. At this time, we ask our husband to come forward to receive our morning time.
before we do anything, first off, happy birthday, Jude. You're an old man now. Welcome to the club. Look 
back to him and said, You're kidding, right? And the Pope said, No, I very seldom ever, really ever get to drive a car. The driver finally gives in and says yes and gets in the back seat. And the Pope gets behind the wheel and he speeds off. And the next thing you know, he's going about 100 miles an hour. And about this time, a policeman uh, pulls him over because he's in a 45 mile an hour speed zone. He pulls him over and motions him to stop. The officer gets out and he walks up to the car and he asks him to roll down the window. And when, when he does what he sees, he's astonished. And he says, I'll be right back. Don't you move. I'll be right back. And the policeman hurries back to his car and he radios the chief. And he says, chief, chief, we got a problem. What kind of problem? Well, I pulled this guy over because he was driving way over the speed limit. But it's somebody really, really important. And the chief says, important like the mayor? No, more important than that. Important like the governor? He said, no, no, no. Way more important than the governor. More important than the president? No, more important than that. Well, who is more important than the president? The policeman said, I don't know, chief, but he has the Pope as his driver. <laughs> don't you love fabricated stories like that but here's the question that I want to ask you this morning and this becomes the backdrop for what I want us to think about today how do you how do you define Greatness. When you hear the word greatness, what is it that you feel? What is it that you experience? What do you think? How do you define greatness? Perhaps if you're a basketball player, you might say it's having 10 three-point shots in one single game. That's how you would define greatness. Or maybe if you were a football player, you might say greatness would be consistently rushing 200 yards or passing for 250. That would be greatness. Or if you were a pop star, you might say it's selling lots and lots of albums and records. If you were a student, it might be getting great grades. That would be greatness. But how do you, how do you define greatness? Business owners are confronted with this all the time. Go into any bookstore and you will find all this material all on the shelves of how business owners are to raise their company up to the next level. Several years ago, a good friend of mine who was in the business world brought a book to me. It was a book entitled, Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. And I thought, why is he giving me this book entitled, Good to Great, that was written for businesses? But the moment that book came out on the shelf, Business owners, church leaders, executives all over the country were grabbing this book, trying once again to help define what greatness is, what greatness was for themselves, what greatness would look like for their company, what greatness would look like for their churches. How do you define greatness? Is it the accumulation of wealth and possessions? Is it the bumper sticker wisdom that we read that says he or she who has the most toys win? Is it popularity? How do you define greatness? Well, if you're wondering how to answer this question, then all we have to do is look closely at 
our scripture text this morning, for Jesus flat out addresses this question. We may not like his answer, but remember this is Jesus who is talking. Jesus in the text says, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. In our scripture reading, Jesus and the disciples, they're walking along this dusty road and they're on their way to Jerusalem. They're on their way to the cross. And they kind of have this shake their head moment and they squint their eyes and they stop and they think about the answer that Jesus has given them. And Jesus perhaps is looking back at himself and thinking, they don't understand. Why are you on this journey with me in the first place if you don't yet understand greatness? And so there's this crisis in the Gospel of Mark because the disciples don't yet understand what greatness is. But Jesus has a lot of patience with his disciples as he does to us. And if you examine the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has told them, he's told all of his followers three times what's going to happen. He's told them about his rejection, about his suffering, about his death. And every time Jesus brings that topic up, they react poorly and it seems to go right over their head. One point in the Gospel of Mark Peter actually has the guts to look at Jesus and I and say, says, Jesus, how dare you talk about your suffering and death? And Peter scolds Jesus. And Jesus' reply must have caused Peter's jaw to drop because Jesus looks at Peter at his response and says, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Because you see, at this point in the Gospel of Mark, things are getting desperate. Because it's only five or six days away from the crucifixion. Only a few more hours before the betrayal and the trial. Just moments away from the triumphant entry into Jerusalem when all of them will shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the disciples are going to start understanding what Jesus has been trying to teach. It ought to be now. But it doesn't seem to be happening. No, these most crucial events are happening, and Jesus' followers don't get it. When those critical moments were at hand, what are the disciples doing? They're all over here in the corner. One, what's in this for me? What am I going to get out of all of this? And then Jesus then looks at them and tells them. Let me tell you something, Jesus says. Whoever wants to be great among you must be served. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then Mark, if you follow the rest of the text, Mark then just leaves us hanging. And then he goes on and tells an encounter about a blind beggar. And we're left to wonder, did the disciples ever really understand what is in store for Jesus? Or maybe, or maybe perhaps the disciples are beginning to understand, to sense a little bit about what Jesus is talking about. About his suffering and rejection and death and crucifixion. And if they do, then his disciples should know at that point this is no laughing matter. I think it's possible that they're beginning to sense what Jesus is saying. And because of that, I think the disciples are a little bit afraid. 
And what do we human beings do when we get afraid? When we are afraid, if there's anything that we want to know in that moment, we want to know in those moments that we have security, that we have a future. And have you ever noticed sometimes we say the most bizarre things in moments when we are afraid? A husband and wife are having a conversation, a very heated conversation. And at one point, trying to prove how important the husband is to his wife, he says, now you listen to me, and you listen good. If it wasn't for my money, you wouldn't have the car that you were driving. If it wasn't for my money, you wouldn't have this house here. If it wasn't for my money, you wouldn't have all of these lavish furnishings. And the wife, in a very calm voice, looks at her husband and says, Now you listen to me. You listen good. If it wasn't for your money, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Jesus 
and these two disciples. And they're furious in this moment with what James and John have asked. And notice how the text ends. Jesus senses what's going on among his 12 followers and he holds them all together. And he turns this frenzied, chaotic moment into a teachable moment and tries to show them what greatness looks like. How do you define greatness? This morning I have two thoughts, two take-home points that I want you to begin to think about. And when you leave here, that's when your work will begin. Greatness. How do you define it? I think the text teaches us, and Jesus would say, greatness comes first and foremost from a heart that has been radically transformed. Greatness comes first and foremost from a heart that has been radically transformed. How does that happen? Well, it happens, it's an act of God. It's nothing less than a miracle. Greatness stems from a heart that's been radically transformed by grace. Some of you will remember this movie called Bruce Almighty. It was out long years ago, but it was about a cable news reporter by the name of Bruce Noble. And if you remember the movie very well, he wants to rise to the top. In fact, he's obsessed with being at the top. He treats everybody in his office and company with disrespect. They don't like him. And when things grow sour, Bruce and his world falls apart. He loses his job. And do you remember, who does he blame for all of this? He blames God. He says, God, you're the one who should have got fired here. And that's the part of the movie I like the best. Because that's when God shows up and he's played by Morgan Freeman. And who can you think of better than to play God than Morgan Freeman? <laughs> and he says, and God speaks in the movie. He says, okay, buddy, you think you can do my job better than I can? I'm going to endow you with all of my powers. Let's see if you can do my job any better. So Bruce takes on the role of God. He parts his tomato soup and he does his crazy things. But he fails miserably at being God and having the things of God because everything that he does is centered around himself <coughs> and no other person. And you may remember in the movie, there's this memorable scene in the movie. This happens at the very beginning of the movie. God is mopping the floor. And Bruce enters, but he doesn't know that it's God. And God says to Bruce, Hey, young man, can you help me? And Bruce laughs. Are you kidding me? I don't have time for this. You're on your own, buddy. But then over the course of the movie, this is near the end of the movie, and Bruce learns two hard lessons of life. He learns two things. One, how much he needs God. And the second thing he learns is the importance of serving others. At one moment, he's at the top, He's got everything, and the next moment, he's completely humble. How many of you remember at the end of the movie, Bruce and God are out there mopping the floor in complete harmony with one another. A lot can happen when a heart is radically transformed by grace. I ask you right now, are you allowing your heart to be radically transformed by grace? How do you define greatness? The second thing the lesson teaches us is that if 
if grace, if greatness equals anything, grace, greatness equals serving others. Jesus had attempted to teach his disciples from the beginning that serving others is what brings true fulfillment and joy in life. I like what Albert Schweitzer, the great missionary minister, said. I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know. The only ones among you who will ever really be happy are the ones who have fought and found a way to serve. It's so true, isn't it? Perhaps you know the name of William Booth. William Booth was a man whose heart was radically transformed by grace. He was a man who understood that greatness always equals serving others. He started a group, a London Christian mission several years ago. You know what it's called today? It's called the Salvation Army. He worked tirelessly throughout his life to feed the hungry, to serve others, to preach the gospel of the good news of Christ to the homeless. And every year his life story goes, he sent out Christmas cards. And in his Christmas cards, he only wrote one word in parentheses, others, others. And before he died, he said, my MO, my purpose, my mission in life is others. And he writes these words. While women weep as they do, I will fight. While children go hungry as they do, I will fight. When men go to prison in and out, in and out as they do, I will fight. While there's a drunkard on the street or a lost little girl on the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, he says, I will fight. I will fight for others to the end. So I want to ask you this morning, how do you define greatness? What do you think of? What do you experience? What do you feel? Well, not only in this text, but in another very familiar text of Christ, Jesus teaches us what true humility and greatness is. Before he goes to the cross, you'll remember this scene. Jesus is with his disciples and he teaches them what humility and true greatness looks like. In John 13, it is recorded for us that Jesus got down on his knees and he took a towel and a basin of water and he washed his disciples' feet. A dirty, filthy job reserved for the lowest ranking person in the room. Was Jesus the lowest ranking person in the room? No, he was not. But Jesus wanted to show them and us. Whoever desires, whoever wishes to be great, must be, first of all, a servant. So this morning, the challenge I want to leave with you is this. Once again, how do you define greatness? What do you think of? What do you experience? What do you feel? Remember, true greatness is a heart that's been radically transformed by God. True greatness in the kingdom of God is serving others. Our challenge this morning is to follow in the example of Christ. 
serving by serving others. Defining not only for them, but for the world what true greatness looks like. And this morning, I, I decided to preach on true greatness because how many of you are like me, have been drawn to the news? How many of you have looked at the devastation in Wilson, Davis, and Putnam County? And when I look out at those scenes, you know what I see? I see people from all over this country coming. And when I look at them, you know what I see? I see servants of God defining for others what true greatness looks like. True greatness is a heart radically transformed by God. True greatness is serving others. So in the days, weeks, and months ahead, may we define true greatness in our own life as we have seen it defined in Christ and in others. Let us pray.
shared the good news.